Welcome to the house of the Lord this morning as we gather together to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our call to worship, the psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Lord Jesus, we are glad to come before you this morning. We thank you that you have called us one by one and that you unite us together in you, the body of Christ. We have come to worship you. We open this service in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Our order of service continues as printed there in your bulletin. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And let us humbly kneel or bow, confess our sins unto the Lord. <laughs> Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto Thee that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against Thee by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to Thine infinite mercy, seeking and imploring Thy grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given thine only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins, and by thy Holy Spirit increase in us true knowledge of thee, and of thy will, and true obedience to thy word, that by thy grace we may come to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given His only begotten Son to die for us and for His sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on His name, He gives the power to become the children of God and grants unto them His Holy Spirit. The one who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, O Lord, unto us all. Amen. Let us please stand. Our introit for this second Sunday after Epiphany is written there in the bulletin. Let us read that together responsively. All the earth shall worship you and shall sing unto you. Make a joyful noise unto God, all you lands. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace that is from above and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the churches of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for them that in faith, piety, and fear of God offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, pity, and defend us, O God, by thy grace. (laughs) 
Our Lord has indeed had mercy and grace upon us. Let's sing to the praise of his name. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. be with you. Let us continue to pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you govern all things in heaven and earth. Mercifully hear the prayers of your people and grant us your peace all the days of our life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Please be seated. The Old Testament lesson for today is from Jeremiah chapter 9, the 23rd through 24th verses. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. 
Let not a rich man boast of his riches. Let him who boasts, boasts of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. And the psalm is Psalm 125, and we'll read that responsively. Those who trust in the Lord are as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, this time forth and forever. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest upon the land of the righteous, so that the righteous will not put forth their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are upright in their hearts. But as for those who turn aside to their perfect ways, the Lord will lead them away with the truth Please be upon Israel. And the epistle lesson is um, from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 to 31. Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is in Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who are in every place, call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, through whom he, for whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment, for I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. Now, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would be made void. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there are not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, so that, just as it is written, let him who boasts, boasts in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Mark, for reading the scriptures this morning. Gradual reading today. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. 
Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Alleluia. Holy Gospel lessons from the Gospel of Matthew, the 20th chapter, beginning with verse 20. Reading in Jesus' name, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right and one on your left. But Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, My cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right and on my left. This is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here ends our gospel lesson. Let us confess together our holy Christian faith by the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Before you're seated, take just a moment to greet those next to you. Ah, uh, thank you. You may be seated at this time. It's a delight to see each of you here this morning. A special welcome to those visiting with us today. I invite everyone to take the red friendship folder to sign that and pass it down to those next to you as well. And we might have a record of your participation uh, in the worship service today. Today is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. Actually, it's this whole week is Sanctity of Human Life Week. Uh, I'm happy to say, though, that at Ruth Fred Church, for us, it's not just a, a one-day or a one-week event, but we want to be a, a church, or a life-loving church all year long, every day of the year, and I, and I believe that we are. But uh, this week especially, it is focused upon uh, because this Wednesday, January 22nd, is the anniversary of Roe v. Wade, which legalized abortion um, up to point of, of birth. Uh, for any time, any reason, here in our nation and in some states lately as well, there's been uh, conversations about um, infanticide and that that would be uh, acceptable as well. So we desperately need to be continuing in prayer for our nation, that God would turn the hearts of our nation, uh, of, our, of our citizens, to, to the Lord and to the Lord of life that way. There's a flyer that you received as well coming in today that that speaks a little bit about that as well. Uh, It's put out by Lutherans for Life, and we're so thankful to be a part of that organization, uh, one of the finest organizations speaking out for life uh, today. And we're very excited as well that this fall, in September, they are coming to Pittsburgh to do a regional uh, conference and uh, they've asked our congregation to, to host them because we've been partners with them. So we're looking at hosting that conference, uh, and our council has uh, uh, moved forward with that as well this fall. So we'll look forward to that as the, as the fall comes. But the flyer, it talks about, did God really say? And, and just how Satan always tries to call into question what God says, and especially on those things of life. And so we want to be faithful to what God has said. 
Also, today is um, we begin our beginning our baby bottle campaign, and there are baskets around the church, the entry points where you may pick up a baby bottle. And I think we have three weeks. Um, Eileen Burnish is in charge of this. Three weeks to fill these up and to bring them back. And these are for our. Um, Pregnancy Resource Center, uh, the Women's Center, that's right here on Drake Road. So it's very local, very much in our midst, and we're a partner with them as well. And I always like to say that, you know, coins, dollars, $100 bills, checks, all kinds of things fit in here. And so fill those up and bring them back so that we might bless uh, this ministry for life right here in our midst. And also we want to be in prayer. There's a March for Life going on in Washington, D.C. Uh, on this Friday near the, uh, near the end of the week. I also want to be praying for our call committee as they are at work in the process of contacting a number of different candidates, and we're really excited about this, and and there's a number of strong candidates that we're looking at that way. Be in prayer for um, Vicar Westerber. As you can tell, he's not here today. He's back in the Midwest. Uh, Last night, he texted me, said he is snowed in. Uh, Yeah, churches all over the place are canceling services, I see, back in the Midwest. The blizzard is, is rolling through. But he has a whole bunch of uh, interviews, um, so tomorrow and Tuesday and so forth. So be in prayer for, for he and Allie. Also Bryce McMinn uh, and Aaron from our congregation, they have those same interviews uh, this week as well too. So be pr- in prayer for them. Uh, Dave Compel had surgery this week. He's doing very well. Saw him the other day. Uh, be praying for him. Uh, Sharon Alsop, Jenna, uh, Judy a uh, number of individuals that way. Marge, uh, Fred's wife, is going to have knee replacement as well coming up, so we want to be praying for those individuals. Again, as far as the Bible reading, over one, well over 100 people are reading through Scripture together. That's so exciting. What a great uh, impact that will have on our congregation. And if you'd like to do it online and haven't yet gotten signed up on that, you can still talk to Don Rosie and jump in any time. And today during Sunday school, if we have some time left after our annual meeting, Uh, We're going to have a question and answer period. So if you've had like a whole bunch of questions from the book of Genesis, there you are, Dave, I see you back there. You slipped in. Awesome. Yeah. If you have questions about the book of Genesis, just bring those questions and uh, we'll see if we can find some answers. But this is exciting as we go through uh, reading scripture together. And then um, obviously our congregational meeting is after the service and the election of officers and our nominating committee has done a tremendous job. Uh, on this, and they've contacted so many, so many people and have come up with a, a very fine slate of individuals there. And there's also uh, an amendment that the uh, elders put together and the council has put forth uh, to be voted on, a biblical guide uh, for ad- addressing uh, godly resolutions of any conflicts that might arise in the congregation. So that will be there as well. And then I just want to say a word about the budget. Um, there's a little piece there in the bulletin, and sometimes when just a few numbers get reported, we're not quite sure, what does that, what does that mean? How are we really doing? Um, thankfully, we ended last year uh, in a very, very good position. Uh, a number of generous gifts coming in, um, extra gifts at the end as well, too. We ended almost in the exact same spot as last year, uh, about $70,000 to the good, uh, and you'll get that report during the annual meeting. Um, part of this, though, was because we didn't have a second pastor during a portion of the year. So otherwise, we probably would have been in the, on the red side of it. But we praise God for how he did provide. But we also are in prayer for God's provision with uh, extra uh, anticipated expenses for uh, this coming year as well, too. So I think that does it for the announcements. At this time, I'm going to call on the kids to come up for our object lesson this morning. I'm missing Vicar today to like call them up and get everything ready here. All right, great to see you guys. Oh, a good group coming up. That is super. Come right on up. Yes, come right on up. Yes. Hey, it's good to see you all. Thanks for coming on up. Yeah. Oh, you'll be okay. You'll be okay right there. Yeah. Good. Hey, what do I have in my hand here today? A phone. phone. You all know what this is, don't you? You know, when I was your age, we didn't have these. You know that? So these are kind of new to me. But for you, it's like your whole life, right? People have these phones all the time. And sometimes it almost seems like they're attached to their head or something, right? Or they have their Bluetooth in and all that stuff, right? Their headset in, all that. Yeah, absolutely. People are on the phone a lot, right? What do we use these for? 
Yeah, call people, of course. Why, why do we call people? Yeah. Oh, that is good, yes. So we don't have to walk over to their house and tell them. Absolutely. It's so much easier just to call them on the phone. Yeah. What, what might we tell them when we call them up? What might we, what might we tell them? Yeah. Okay. You could ask them if they need something. We could come and, like, help them. Right? Yes. You ever call someone up, like, maybe grandma and grandpa and tell them that you love them? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that works well also. You send text messages maybe on the phone? You guys, you guys don't use phones, do you? I have an iPod. Oh, you even have, oh, oh, okay, you even have phones. Okay, yes, absolutely. So you can do texting, uh, iPad, okay, all kinds of ways that we can communicate, we can call out to people. Well, in our scripture passage today, God is calling people. You think God uses a phone? No. Hey, calling up Isaiah. Hey, Jonah, Sienna. Uh, God doesn't use the phone, does he? No. So how does God call us? How does God call us? Well, the Apostle Paul, God called him from heaven. He just called out to him. His name was Saul. And he says, Saul, Saul. That kind of scared him, actually. He fell off his horse. Okay, that was, can you imagine? A voice from God from heaven. Yeah, that, that scared him a lot. But now Paul is talking about being called by God. And God has called him specially and told him how much he loves him. But well, God calls us through his word, though, doesn't he? Through the Bible? That's God calling us. That's his word speaking to us. Through baptism, God calls us to himself as well. Holy communion, God comes to us. So there's a lot of ways that God calls out to us and speaks to us and comes to us. And God wants to tell us how much he loves us. And he wants us to come close. And it says in the Bible, it's the Holy Spirit's job, and the Holy Spirit, of course, is God, to call us and to gather us together to enlighten our hearts, to help us understand, and to save us, and then to keep us in his family. So God is like always calling to our hearts and our minds. So that's our prayer today, is that we would listen to God as he speaks to us in his word. So that's what we're doing right now, isn't it? We're listening about God here at church, right? We're listening to God in his word. And at home, when your moms and dads, or your grandmas and grandpas, I read the Bible to you, listening to God's word to you. Okay, so God speaks, speaks to your heart. And then God also wants us to call out and share the good news with other people. Okay, so let's pray. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you love us so much that you have called out to us. You have gathered us together, brought us into your family. We thank you for your great love for us. Lord, we pray that you would help us in calling out to others also and telling them about you, Jesus. And I just pray your blessing on these kids now in your name. Amen. All right, thank you guys for coming and helping me this morning. God bless you. I'm going to call upon the choir at this time to share with us for the glory of the Lord.
Our scripture passages have been read in their entirety. We're reading a couple verses again from our text of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 2. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord God, we do pray that you would quiet our hearts before you this morning. Pray that you would speak so clear and fresh to us today. Pray that by your Holy Spirit that you would apply your words to us individually as well as corporately as the body of Christ. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of every heart might be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. Titled the message this morning called, The Call, The Called, The Christ and the Cross. Many of you know that I love the Lord of the Rings movies, and in this trilogy, the future of Middle-earth is at stake as the cosmic powers of good and evil collide. And in the midst of this, a little hobbit named Frodo Beggins is called or chosen for the mission of a lifetime, and it might well cost him his life. He will not be able to accomplish the mission alone. To ensure the success of the mission, the Fellowship of the Ring is formed, with other individuals who pledge their very lives to the success of the mission. They will face many challenges and trials and temptations, both as individuals as well as a group together. They will doubt each other at different times. They will even come close to killing each other because of the power of the presence of evil around them. But they stay together, some even sacrificing their lives. And the mission is accomplished. Today we begin our new preaching series of the book of 1 Corinthians, The Spiritual Life of the Christian and the Congregation. And this New Testament book in particular, more than any other, gives us special insight and direction regarding the new life that we have in Christ and how it is to be lived out individually as well as corporately in the fellowship of the congregation. Now the Apostle Paul has, had visited Corinth about five years earlier on a mission trip, And shared the good news about Jesus. And as a result of that, the church had started. But the church had gone through a number of challenges. And Paul writes them this letter to respond to some of those issues. And to remind them of who they are and whose they are. That they are Christians. They belong to Christ. And that they are to be one in the body of Christ, the church. And so we come to the call of God. The first chapter centers around the concept of being called by God for a particular purpose. Uh, This calling both gives life and also directs every aspect of that new life. Paul begins by identifying himself as one who is called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Paul has been chosen or called by God's holy will. Uh, Paul had the additional calling as being an apostle with what we would say the capital A. He had the apostolic authority. Uh, The apostle means sent one. Now, we are also sent ones and apostles in that sense, but with the small a, not a capital A. We don't have the apostolic authority of those original apostles, but we also are sent, called and sent with the good news. And Paul includes in this letter his apostolic credentials and authority because he's going to be addressing the spiritual needs of the church through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And at the same time, Paul is also very humble and aware of his sin and his need for a Savior himself. In fact, he calls himself the least of the apostles, one who came to faith late in life and only after first persecuting the church, killing Christians. But now Paul loves the church. And therefore, Paul loves the body of Christ. He loves Christ. He loves the church, the body of Christ. Because of his love, his heart is burdened for the church in Corinth. And he's willing to address with them uh, some some very challenging issues. And because of his love for them, he's willing to to risk even as a pastor to them. One of my prayers is that my love for our congregation might grow more deeply. And that I would be willing to engage even more so in in issues that we might face, regardless of how challenging or convicting they might be, or risky that might be, both on an individual level as well as a a congregational level, out of of love for the Lord and love for you, and that we might follow more closely uh, together following Jesus. 
And so out of his great love for them, Paul reminds them that they also have been called and been chosen by God. And that's our second point there, is called by God. He addresses them as the church of God, which is at Corinth. To those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Paul packages a lot of things in that long sentence. He says, the church of God. He reminds them that the church belongs to God. It's not an institution or a country club. It is, it's the body of Christ. It belongs to God. And God has brought us into it. He reminds them that they are sanctified. We are saved, sancta, we are saved, through Jesus Christ alone, by his grace through faith alone. And that the saints, the holy ones of God, are so because of God's calling. This is Holy Spirit work to call, to gather, to enlighten, to sanctify, and to preserve us in the one true faith. And so he points them to the Holy Spirit. He points them to the Godhead, to the Trinity. He says, to those who have been sanctified. Now, Paul knows that not everyone has responded, though, to the Holy Spirit. To those who have, though, they are sanctified. Those who have, they are part of the invisible body of Christ, whereas Paul knows that there might be many who are part of the visible body congregation might have their their name on the membership roll, but might not be part of the true body of Christ, the invisible church. So it's to those who have been. But the call is there for all to come and to receive, to accept the grace of Jesus. It says, true Christians are united with all who are in every place who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. There is a union, there is a call here of solidarity, a union of Christians all around the world to all who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are to be united with them, connected with them. We've talked a little bit about just this last uh, Wednesday and journey through the Word in the evening about the suffering church. And how this last year, over 9,000 churches were attacked around the world. Over 4,000 Christians were killed for their faith this last year. That's over 11 Christians per day are martyred for their faith. We are one with them. We have solidarity. We have union with them in our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul uses the word Lord seven times in just the first ten verses. The point is that Christians are under the lordship of Jesus. He is the Lord of our life. Whatever he says... That goes. We want to be obedient to him in thought, word, and deed. And throughout the book, Paul will address how our thoughts are to be submitted to Jesus. Our words, what we say, uh, what we do in areas of, of handling our money, our sexuality, what we eat, how we conduct business, how we worship, how we love, all of those things Paul addresses. And as followers of Jesus, we want every aspect of our life to come under his authority. We struggle with this because so often we think we might miss out on something. Money, sex, position, power, food, recognition, whatever. We fear that we are getting behind as we look at the culture around us, chasing after all those worldly things. And we feel like we must maneuver to get those things for ourselves as we see best. Today, prosperity theology, which is a corruption of Christian teaching and kind of a commingling of Christianity and materialism, it's sweeping through North America. And, and the lie in it is that as soon as you have enough prosperity, you will, you will have peace. And that God wants you just to focus on, on having plenty in this world. And it's, it justifies people's earthly drive, or drive for earthly prosperity. But in these next verses, Paul says, Grace and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, You can't experience peace through earthly prosperity. You need to first experience God's grace. That's what this is all about. And Paul reminds them that they were enriched in Jesus so that you are not lacking in any gift. God has already given you all that you need through Christ, and it's in the church. Again, Paul is calling them to refocus on Christ and the church, the body of Christ, to find your life in Christ and that new life lived out together in the church. He says in verse 9, God has called you into the fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Coming back to the movie, The Lord of the Rings, the fellowship of the rings. These individuals who are included in this fellowship, they are an unlikely, diverse, and disagreeable set of characters. And yet each gifted in different ways, each essential to the mission to which they were called. But they had to surrender themselves to something greater than themselves. And this takes humility. 
and our pride and our self-interest must take a back seat. If they did not stay united in the fellowship of the ring, their mission would fail, and consequences would bring ultimate death to, to everyone. And this is what brings us to Paul's immediate concern then as well, called to unity in Christ. In verse 10, Paul says, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, there are to be no divisions among you. And that word divisions is a word for, for tearing or fracturing or the ripping of a garment. And Paul says, I have been informed concerning you, my brothers, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels or divisions or factions among you. Now, it's important to note here that Paul identifies where he heard this. No place is given for secrecy or rumors or gossiping or whispering in the corners about someone. But rather, there's openness and transparency. And the instruction of Jesus in Scripture is followed as this issue is then addressed. Now, we don't know for sure what motivated the divisions, but for some reason, different aspects of the congregation prefer different spiritual leaders to others. Now, that's fine. They're all preaching the same message, and they're all together in loving the church. But certain members were trying to drive a wedge between the leaders and trying to advance an agenda by using, uh, of their own by using the leaders. And, and so some were saying, I, I'm of Paul. I'm in Paul's camp. And others were like, well, I'm of, a, I'm of a Apollos. Apollos is the best. Others are, I'm of Cephas, which is the Apostle Peter. And then others were like, well, I'm of Christ. I'm just above all the rest of you people who are, you know, uh, campaigning here. I, I'm, a, I'm of Christ. And, and so Paul says, none of that. None of that. Now, now, Paul had started the church. Yes, that's true. In 2 Corinthians, we find out that some, though now, found him to be unimpressive, lacking in his personal appearance and charisma. He said he writes a good letter, but when he shows up, he's not too impressive. Now, Apollos, he was an impressive speaker, though. It says he was eloquent. In fact, Paul even says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul says, I watered, but Apollos, I, excuse me, Paul says, I planted, but Apollos watered. So Paul says, we've been in partnership together. Don't try to drive us apart. Cephas, the apostle Peter, he had likely traveled to Corinth. And Paul does refer to Cephas' travels with his wife. And perhaps they had been just this incredible husband-wife team, whereas Paul was unmarried. And, and Peter was, was bold and brash in speaking, although he wasn't a good writer, though. But maybe Peter was more to the liking of the Jewish Christians uh, rather than the Greek Christians because Peter had struggled with some of those areas of, of legalism, of what could one eat or who could they associate with or what could they wear or who could they talk to and so forth. And, and maybe some of those who were uh, more in align with some of those legalistic laws, uh, they thought maybe they could use Peter to advance their agenda. And Paul says to them, he says, is Christ divided? Was Christ crucified? I mean, excuse me. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? He says, no, only Christ was crucified for you. Were you baptized into the name of Paul? No. He says, we are all just ministers of the gospel. We are all just servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not about human leadership. It's about the authority and the lordship of Jesus. We are to hear his word as from him. Not to build camps around favorite pastors or worship styles or, or, or you name it. About 10 years ago, and many of you remember this, the Reverend Dr. D. James Kennedy passed away suddenly uh, from a heart attack. He was the founding pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. And he had had an incredible ministry for 50 years. He had founded Evangelism Explosion to help people share the gospel with their neighbors. He had a TV program that had 3 million followers. He had founded a seminary. He was heavily engaged in political activism. The church had thousands of members. And God had given him a ministry niche that really only he could fill. But when he died, the church was in shock and in panic. Who could they get to fill this place? Who could, who could be another D. James Kennedy? There was no one exactly like him in the U.S., and indeed there wasn't. Finally, they settled on Billy Graham's grandson, Tulian Trevigian. He was a rising star as a Christian leader at the time, and his future looked incredibly bright. But the congregation ended up being divided and fractured into pieces. Each group had their own agenda. Trevigian was not just like Dr. Kennedy. To some, he could never measure up. Uh, some members wanted to keep the church exactly the same as it was. Others wanted to use it as an opportunity to try new areas of ministry. And the, and the tearing quickly ripped the church apart. And, and, and the choir, and there were, there were hundreds 
of people in the choir, because it's a huge church. Uh, they, they, most of them decided they didn't really care for Trevigian, <laughs> and, and many would hiss and huff at him as, as they walked by him. And some would get up and, and leave after they sang um, before the message as a way to protest him. Now, by the way, that's not why some of our choir members get up and leave after they sing. Uh, some of them, they have been at the, uh, at the other service and they have stayed to sing at the next one and then they leave. I just want you to know that, right, Bob? Yeah. Sometimes I feel like we should say that. So there, now we always know that. We have a fine choir. But eventually, one of the factions, uh, they had the upper hand and they crushed Trevigian. And he lost his health, he lost his marriage, and he lost his ministry. And those individuals were happy. They'd driven him out. But unfortunately, the congregation died as well, and the church is no more. And God wept because Satan won. And that's why Paul is so adamant on this point. He says, it's only Christ. He says, don't waste your life. Don't waste the life of the church fighting each other and and miss out on following Jesus. This is very timely for us as well today as we're in the process of calling a second pastor. It needs to be a matter of urgent prayer. Uh, For most of all, we want God's good and perfect will for our church. I'm praying for this. The call committee is praying for this. Our entire congregation is praying for this. Um, I don't know exactly how that's going to unfold, but we pray and we trust God and follow his lead. We're tempted to rely on our own plans and personnel and programs. We're tempted to try and build the church according to our human wisdom. But as Christians, we're called to live according to the wisdom of God, which is foolishness in the eyes of the world. In fact, our very message is the message of the cross, which is the epitome of foolishness to those who are unsaved. And our closing point is called to the cross. Paul says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Verse 21, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the cross preached to save those who believe. This is what Nietzsche mocked as God on a cross. Nietzsche wrote, When we hear the ancient bells growling on a Sunday morning, wow, what an attitude there, huh? We ask ourselves, is it really possible? This for a Jew crucified 2,000 years ago who said he was God's son? How foolish, even how ghoulish, to believe this nonsense of a primitive past. Can one believe that such things are still believed? God declares, I'm willing to look foolish. I'm willing to be crucified on a cross because God is saving all who believe and receive. God's wisdom is our salvation. So Paul closes out the chapter by saying, Consider your own calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise, according to the flesh. Not many of you were mighty. Not many of you were noble. It says God didn't call you because you were so smart or so well-educated or worldly wise or because you were so mighty and powerful and wealthy and influential or that you were so noble and highly esteemed in social circles and had special privileges and positions. But rather, God called you. He chose you because you were willing to be emptied out for him and to be filled with Christ and be connected into Christ, the body of Christ, the church of Christ. He has called you to reflect him because it's not about us, it's about Jesus. And when the world sees our brokenness, let them see God's healing. When the, ro- when the world sees our weakness, let them see God's strength. When the world sees our failures, let them see God's perfect holiness. When the world sees our repentance, let them see God's forgiveness. When the world sees our surrender, let them see God's salvation. Paul is saying, if you want to talk about someone or something, let it be this. Let it be about our Lord Jesus Christ. Casting Crowns sings the song, Nobody. Let me close with a few words. Why you ever chose me has always been a mystery. All my life I've been told I belong at the end of a line. With all the other not-quites, with all the never-get-it-rights. But it turns out they are the ones you were looking for all this time. Because I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody all about somebody who saved my soul. Ever since you rescued me, you gave my heart a song to sing. And I'm living for the world to see nobody but Jesus. I'm living for the world to see nobody but Jesus. And so let me go down, down, down in history as another blood-bought faithful member of the family. And if they all forget my name, well, that's fine with me. I'm living for the world to see nobody but Jesus. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus.
God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have life everlasting. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these gifts that have been given in your name as act of worship. We pray that you would receive them, multiply them, bless them, use them to proclaim forth the good news, the good news that you have called out to a lost world to bring many into your family. We pray in your name. Amen. This time, let us please kneel or bow for our closing prayer. Lord Jesus, we continue to bow before you and we pray that you would indeed be the Lord of our life. Lord, we pray that we wouldn't just say those words, Lord Jesus Christ, but that we would submit ourselves to your lordship. We thank you that you have called us, that you have brought us, that you have saved us, brought us into the family of God. We pray that you would help us to live for you each and every day in every aspect of life. Lord, we ask your forgiveness where we fall so short in so many different ways. And we do thank you that you desire to rush to our side and to give new chances, new starts in you, Lord God. Lord, we pray that you would also be at work in our midst because you've called us not only to to you individually, but you've called us to one another as well, to be united in the body of Christ. And so we pray that you would grow us in our love for one another, and that you would help us in our service one to another. Lord, we pray your special blessing on the call committee as they continue to be at work. And Lord, we just thank you as you've been leading and guiding them. Just pray your hand upon them. Lord, we pray for Vicar Westerber and for uh, Bryce McMinn as well, too, as they have their interviews these next days, that you'd give them a peace and a calmness, Lord God. You'd give them recall as they respond to the many different questions that are put before them. Lord, we pray for our nation as we think of sanctity of, of human life, especially this week, but Lord, all year round here. And we just pray that you would be turning the hearts 
of people in our nation to you and to love the life that you give and that you cherish. Lord, we thank you that we've been able to be a partner with so many ministries for life, and we pray your blessing upon each one. Lord, we pray for our nation as well right now during this trying time, and that your hand would be upon it. And we pray for our leaders, Lord God, and that you would be at work within their hearts. And Lord God, we thank you that you promise that you turn the hearts even of kings as easily as rivers of water. And so, Lord, even though so many have different agendas and so forth, God, we pray that you would do your will, your way, in your time. We pray for your continued healing hand uh, to rest upon Dave Compel, Lord God, and also Judy Boyd and Sharon Alsop. And we pray for Marge, Lord, as, as she prepares for surgery this week as well, that you would strengthen her and then give healing to her. Lord, we continue to pray in the quietness of our heart before you. And let us pray together as our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.